If you're looking for success in the vacation rental industry, Heather Bayer and the team at CottageBlogger.com are here to show you that it's entirely within reach. Welcome to Vacation Rental Success, the show that features interviews with industry experts, successful vacation rental owners, and more, all geared toward helping you make it happen. Here's your host, Heather Bayer. Wow, that is, that's great. That is my new uh, introductory music and, uh, and voiceover, and I love it. I hope you do too. And a big shout out to Tim Page at uh, timthepage.com, and that's page spelt P-A-I-G-E. So if you're thinking about doing a podcast and want a really professional intro and outro, Tim Page is definitely the one to go to. So welcome to Vacation Rental Success, episode number 17. This week's episode tackles a topic that we probably don't all think about a huge amount, but it's a topic that we should be thinking about in the vacation rental industry because it's it's something that could impact us hugely uh, at any point during uh, during any year, and that is insurance. And I, I know from my own experience that trying to get rental insurance on my property has not been the the easiest over time. And, and we actually, actually had, uh, in our region, we had to go for a commercial policy because we, we wanted to rent, you know, we've got a, an investment, two investment properties. We want to rent them year round. So that, that means we want them available to be rented at any time during the year. We can't be restricted to a certain number of weeks which the majority of insurance uh, companies in in uh, Ontario uh, seem to restrict um, many owners to. So, uh, so yes, we have a commercial policy, which is uh, probably not giving us the best coverage. And after talking to my guest today, I'm going to go back up to my policy and sit down for a couple of hours and really go through the small print. So here we go. I'm delighted to have with me today uh, Phil Schofield, who's the head of inbound marketing at Schofield's Insurance. And they are specialist insurers of holiday homes, um, what we call in North America vacation rentals, um, but in the UK and Europe. Now, Schofield's only cover UK residents, but uh, the insurance risks are universal. So what we're going to talk about in the next um, 30 minutes or so uh, will hopefully make you think about the insurance cover you have and uh, and just to ultimately ensure that you're well protected. Phil's also a holiday rental owner um, who has 10 years experience as an owner. So he comes to this not only with the insurance expertise, but also with the insider knowledge of being an owner himself. Now, Phil blogs and tweets marketing tips and advice on running a successful cottage business from um, his website at uh, www.scofields.ltd.uk. And uh, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Phil also is a, an inveterate tweeter. We, we do have occasional conversations backwards and forwards on Twitter. So head over to Twitter and I'll put to Phil's um, Twitter name in the show notes too, connect with him and then you'll get notice of his latest blog posts and uh, and any chat that's going on about insurance and about vacation rentals as well. So hello Philip, how are you doing? And I love your accent. As you know, my I've got family from your part of the, uh, the UK. So um, how are you doing today? I'm very well, Heather. Thank you very much. And I'm uh, glad you can understand the Northern accent. Uh, yes, well, I definitely can. I would imagine a lot of our Canadian and and uh, American uh, listeners can also understand it because um, we are loyal watchers of Coronation Street. It's been going in Canada and the US for many, many years. And in fact, uh, my, my grandmother lived on uh, a street called Gate Street in Blackburn and uh, and she owned the corner shop the street had a pub at the other end and it was all terraced houses exactly like Coronation Street. Um, so I just thought I'd share that with you because, uh, you know, the moment I heard your accent, it just took me back to my childhood 
uh, in Gate Street. But we're here today to talk about insurance. And I just want to kick off really with um, just um, asking what a, a new owner, somebody who's very new to the rental market, is maybe considering buying a property to rent it out. What, is, what are the first things that they should be considering uh, in terms of, uh, of risk? What, what should they think about? Yeah, the, the first thing is to, um, before you even buy a property, I suppose, is uh, check any risk that will affect that property, whether that be it uh, uh, flood risks, hurricane, uh, wildfires or earthquakes or subsidence. Um, just get a, try and get a quotation off a local broker. And if there are any risks, they should, should be highlighted. Um, we've seen in the UK this winter the effects of flooding and the you know the 800 million pounds worth of damage uh, since December. So it's very important to you know these. It's a big financial asset your vacation home, and uh, small incidents like theft are quite insignificant compared to a natural disaster or a major fire, which uh, could be hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it's it's, it's imperative that you get uh, protected against these major risks. Everybody over here in in Canada and the, and the U.S. saw the coverage from from the U.K. floods. That was uh, the pretty devastating. As you say, every area has a different risk. You know, you look down in the uh, the F- Florida, the Gulf Coast, and uh, the eastern part of the U.S. That's impact can be impacted by hurricanes, as you mentioned, wildfires in in and earthquake risk in California. And, and perhaps tornado risks across the Midwest. So wherever you're buying a property, obviously, that, that is something to really think about. Before somebody lists their property for rental, what are the things they should be considering as risks? And you just mentioned that, you know, small things like theft are, are nothing in relation to the to the major risks of losing a home, say, in a wildfire. But still, people that, that are investing in a vacation home, they are thinking about, uh, about the smaller things that they want to cover. So what, what should be front of their mind? Front of their mind should be uh, the public liability. You know, we, we live in a blame society, you know, slips and trips. Public liability, if someone was to, to be injured on the property, uh, guests staying there, and we've seen some recent cases in the UK where a postman tripped on a cracked paving stone and, and sued a grandmother. Um, there was another sad case where an 18-year-old girl was paralysed after diving into a, a friend's swimming pool and uh, tried to sue the homeowners. And more recently, a holiday maker died after tragically falling down some stairs in a holiday cottage. So the liability is essential to protect should you have to defend uh, a legal case against yourselves as owners. Um, and what sort of um, cover are we looking at? Because I'm often asked that question, how much, how much liability cover should we have? Yeah, well, we all know that you know, legal fees can escalate uh, when, when two parties are fighting out. So we, we recommend, say, three to five million sterling so that as, as a suitable level. Some agencies might recommend that you have a, a require a minimum level if you're listing with them also. Yes, yes, we we actually um, do that with our own agency. We will not take on any property unless uh, we have sight of their of their liability cover. Although, having said that, we we don't put a minimum on it. Maybe that's something we should be thinking about in the future. Because you're absolutely right. We we live in this society where they cut their thumb on a on a, a bit of um, sharp tile in a kitchen and they want to get some money out of it. It's it's a sad state, but uh, it's it's where we are now, isn't it? Yeah, and especially if you know if you let guests use bicycles, a trampoline at your property, a hot tub swimming pool, um, canoes, it's just worthwhile always checking with your insurer. You know what would happen? Are you covered if somebody had an accident using that? And uh, you need to keep make sure that everything's in safe working order to try and avoid uh, negligence, negligence issues. We are in an area where every property, every one of our properties, provides watercraft. So when we make sure it's unmotorized watercraft, but every place will have a canoe or a kayak or a rowboat or a paddle boat. And it is part of our standards that we check every year to make sure these these, um, items are in in good working order. I have um, I had a new car a few years ago and in the manual it has dozens of safety tips such as 
don't stand up with your head out of the sunroof mm. at any time when the car is in motion, particularly when driving under a low bridge. And we, we, we spent a happy hour of a journey going through the manual, reading all these things out and going, this is crazy. You know, we never do any of these things. But I'm assuming that these are in there to protect the car manufacturer from such a claim that nobody ever told them that they shouldn't stand up with their head out of the window when they're driving under a low bridge. Yeah, I think we all know that guests don't read, uh, or, they, or they, they browse through guest manuals and they don't read the fine details. So it's it's highly unlikely that unless you put post-it notes everywhere, they're going to read these things. Um, so it, it all boils down to if, if something does go wrong, that whether the homeowner has been negligent. So I suppose it's up to the owners just to, you know, try and make them aware of these things where possible, and just to make sure everything's in work in order you know if there is a, a loose bit of carpet near stairs it, it should be fixed because it could be proven that the owner was negligence then and that's when the the, the uh you know they the, the could be liable if if there is a claim phil who's the onus on is it on the homeowner to um to show that they were not negligent or is it on the guest to show that the homeowner was not neg- was negligent <sighs> And that's uh, that's where the legal the legal people come into force. But I think it's uh, first the it's it's very rarely that people are negligent. To be honest with you, mm. unless they they have they have ignored issues. Most things are accident. So it's up to the to the legal guys to prove that. I know there is there's an outstanding claim in the Ontario courts at the moment where or the child of a guest dived off a dock into water that was too shallow and uh, and had and sustained some quite damaging injuries and they're suing the property owner for not telling them that the water wasn't deep enough for diving and and that to me you know it's just like well gosh it's common sense but it has prompted us as as a responsible agency to actually find out from every property owner the depth of the water at the end of a dock so that we just put it in our listing, in fact, and said the depth of the water at the end of the dock is approximately four to five feet or approximately three to four feet. And then we say we do not encourage diving or jumping from any dock. If people then want to do it, that's entirely up to them. Yeah, I don't think there's much more as an owner can do, really, is there? apart from, you know, trying to educate and uh, it's left to judgment. It's easy for us to say, well, it's common sense. But if there's a loophole somewhere, then somebody's going to try and find it. So we have to do, I guess we have to do as much as we possibly can. And I, I'm so, I mean, you mentioned post-it notes and I've seen these in so many places. People have gone to town and put little post-it notes next to the sockets that just say, please do not allow your children to put their fingers in here. I'm not a fan of, I'm not a fan of those, are you? <laughs> no, not at all. And I, and I said to that particular owner, I said, well, well instead of, putting notices next to all these out electrical outlets why don't you get outlet covers if they while they're in residence then de- decide to take the outlet covers off and and somebody hurts themselves by putting a little finger in there then i i think the owner has done their due diligence by providing the safety item i mean i know it would come yeah. down to the legal side of it again but uh, we can only go so far and it like i say it boils down to you know has the owner been negligent? Mm-hmm. And, it, and, and most most owners aren't. So it's uh, it's uh, the, the claims are few and far between. But when there are when there are grey areas, the legal costs can uh, escalate. So it's public liability is, is obviously essential when letting. Okay, let's talk about theft because uh, when I when I take on new owners, they often say to me, "I'm you know I'm going to strip the place of absolutely everything and just leave the basics because I've heard that." Uh, that renters steal. It's a, it's a way that people look at things, and I, I do try and change that uh, that way of thinking and get them round to looking at um, at it from a hospitality perspective. And the fact that these aren't, and I, I I I dislike the term renters as much as I dislike the term punters when I was in England. Um, so you know, I, I encourage them to think about guests rather than renters, and then also to think that you do have to supply them with the comforts of home and also to make a property look welcoming, which really means leaving your nice stuff in there. So tell me about your um, perspective on the things that people take away from vacation rentals. I think a lot of it is, 
you know, some of it can kind of be intentional. You can you can imagine uh, people rushing around with a plane catch. Somebody will take a, a towel, a beach towel, thinking it's theirs. You know, um, things things always go missing, but they're all they always tend to be things that are uh, insignificant, but they do matter to their owner, such as a bottle opener, a thing like that. You know, it will that will matter to the next guest because there's not one there, and there'll be a complaint, but. Things go missing, but very rarely are, you know, significant items stolen. Do you know, I've never actually come across it. And we, we do up to 1,600, I think last year we did 1,600 rentals. And, and that, that's across the agency and have never had an incidence of theft. And, you know, when, when I say that, I'm, I'm not thinking about, you know, the occasional towel or... A, gone through a, a couple of weeks in my own place of losing sheets people seem to be taking yeah. sheets home with them and, it, and it's it's an annoyance but to me it is just the cost of doing business comes and, with a territory yeah yeah and, and it needs to be factored into the um to the overall uh cash flow that these things are going to happen and you really are going to have to replace them uh, along the way you know as far as insurance is concerned no one's going to claim on their insurance for the odd towel or or a sheet going missing. One one loophole to look out for is <clears throat> with the theft is if uh, non forced non forced entry. If it's theft by non forced entry. So let's say if you were burgled and uh, somebody entered via an open window. Say the guests have gone to a beach, left the window open, or even you know we've we've seen ourselves people leave doors open for other members of the holiday party. Somebody went in there, or even used a a key which was so-called hidden under a, uh, a plant pot in a key safe. If somebody broke in without forcing actual door or window, there are some policies that exclude that. So that's just one one area to check. Oh, that's really interesting. And I, because I, I know in our part of the world, nobody locks doors anyway. I've been amazed at where people leave their keys here. And we have some small properties that rent at about five hundred dollars a week, where there's multiple locks on the doors, and and then there is um, there is one large property I know of that rents at six thousand dollars a week, and the keys in the barbecue. <laughs> um, yeah, but that that's interesting about non forced entry. It's not something that I I had thought about checking on an insurance policy. So that's a, that is a great tip. I know holiday homes more and more so are being kitted out luxury but um, very often we see break-ins where the actual cost of somebody trying to break in exceeds the value stolen because it's you know with inside it's what can they get their hands on it's a tv uh you know maybe uh you know docking station and what have you so the, the, the values that's stolen often is less than the damage caused by forcing windows and doors so maybe your better to, your best idea is to leave the doors open i don't know <laughs> So, so what do rental policies uh, generally cover, and and what should I, you know, we we've covered a couple of things that owners should ask questions about. Is there anything else that we've missed here? Um, obviously, with with regard to the theft, you need to um, check any security requirements on the policy. Say if you've uh, on your if you've applied for insurance and you've agreed that you've got certain locks, you've got an alarm that you're going to use to make sure that if you've said you're going to use those, that they are enforced when the property is empty. Obviously, and and. I, Accidental damage by guests, people knocking over television, spillages. I know there's some people take damage deposits. I, I think the jury's out on that one. You know, we used to take them. But unless you can kind of prove who's done the damage, it, it's very difficult to deduct from one because it could just open to kind of worms and maybe negative reviews. So I'm not quite sure about damage deposits. Yeah, I'm absolutely with you on this one. Um we haven't collected a damage deposit for, for years on our places. We've never had any damage. And um, well, Having said that, there was one incident when some children deliberately, and they were teenage children, deliberately um, broke a hot tub cover. It's $500, these, these hot tub wow. covers. Yeah. And, uh, and we went after the, um, we went after the um, guest for that, and, and she very reluctantly paid up because, because we had the photographs of beginning and end. Uh, you know, b before and after. And it was very clear that what had happened was three kids, one was sitting in the middle of the hot tub cover and the other two on either side tried to push the cover up. And, of course, it's polystyrene. So, <laughs> so yeah. it, it, uh, it snapped in, in two places. Um, so she, she paid up and then um, left me a one-star review about how awful I was to, uh, to ask for this to be covered. 
Yeah, I, I think accidents are accidents, but whether you know it's it's kind of malicious or be, through through uh, mistreating things, then you know true for losses. As I said before, and you said it, it is part of the cost of of being in this business. Accidents will happen, and and I've heard of of owners who will go after a guest from a damaged deposit because they broke a lamp or just just the little things that really should be covered, taken into account. And really, if people don't leave a place in a good condition, don't have them back. What about if a guest causes damage? Let's say they do major damage. Let's say, um, I'm, and I did hear of, of one this winter, which, which made me wince, was about a, a property that had a hardwood floor and somebody, a guest had walked in wearing winter snow boots with with ice cleats on them. Now, I wear these boots all the time when I go out because it is all, always so icy. And they're, they're like, um, you know, very sharp studs. They're going to um, hook into the ice so that you don't fall over. But they also hook into a hardwood floor. <laughs> and this guest had walked right through the property with and backwards and forwards with these um with these boots on um so what what would happen in in that instance in terms of uh, of an insurance policy would that cover the replacement of a hardwood floor i think that that's going into the the issue of uh, accidental damage i suppose as well even though and obviously another issue is a uh, malicious damage if if someone you know we've seen we've seen occasions where there's people have domestics within properties and things have, have got broken so the issue there uh, yeah, first of all, is uh, teenage insurance covers the accidental stroke malicious damage. And if not, you know, like you said before, should should the owner have to claim on their insurers, pay in excess? Maybe it's worth going after, uh, after the guest and even using the small claims call. I'm not sure if you've got one. Over yeah, there. yes, yeah. We we have the same same similar small claims, but I th- I think all owners are going to say, well, wouldn't my insurance policy? Wouldn't I just sort of claim on my insure on my rental insurance for that? Yeah, that's something to check if, if yeah. their policy covers that. Yeah. So, so it would be worthwhile for somebody who's taking out a policy to actually maybe come up with a couple of scenarios that they ask their insurer about. You know, like what if? You know, some some what yeah. ifs. But yeah, the guest accidental damage, yeah. any damage that the guest causes that isn't the homeowner, uh, what would be covered? Say, if if they damaged this, spilt something, broke something, you know, would, would that be covered? Yeah, I know there's some of the larger listing sites now offer the option of an accidental damage protection plan so that um, for, for a, a small fee, uh, guests can purchase this and, uh, and then in the event of accidental damage, they, they will be covered for up to a, a certain amount. We actually offer this in our, in our own company and it works really, really well. Um, we encourage all our guests to buy this, and uh, and in fact, the majority of them do. Yeah, yeah, it's not something I've seen over in the UK much, but I have seen it on the on the infamous states and uh, some of the big listing sites over there. Yeah, yeah, we we've we've had a couple of claims, and and they all seem to be countertops in kitchens, hot yeah. pans. Yeah, hot pan on a countertop, and uh, you know, once once you've got a hole, I have a, I actually have a hole in my countertop in my own cottage. That, uh, that one of my guests damaged uh, last year, and he had the accidental damage protection plan. So we, we that that was that was covered. We we are about to uh, replace that entirely. So yeah, there's only there's only so many burn marks you can cover with uh, appliances in the kitchen, isn't it? <laughs> yes, mine is currently covered with a breadboard. <laughs> um, let's let's move on to just the issue of pets. Uh, ah, good, yeah, good topic. <laughs> Um, my properties are pet friendly. I'm, I'm a pet lover. We, I often think that we have, um, we will get less damage from, uh, guests with pets than we do from guests with children. But, uh, I know that our insurance cover doesn't cover pet damage. Yeah. You make a very good point that, you know, there's, there's probably more damage by children than there are pets. Um, but more importantly, it's like saying, just check in if you are covered by pet damage, you know, one in, one in five customers now take a dog with them on holiday from stats I've seen in the UK. So it's you know it's quite a niche area that can get bookings, especially in the off season. So make damage kind of trivial really. It's you know down to chewing, unfamiliar territory, scratching, fouling. Uh, but a lot of policies don't cover that. But but we cover that, and it's it's worth checking with your insurer if you can get that uh, oh, so, so cover. 
<clears throat> so some some insurers will cover for for pet damage over here. Yeah, there are there are some who yeah. will do it. Many don't, uh, and it's not not even if you are. You know, some guests do do smuggle pets into properties. I don't know if you come across this, but that's what being pet friendly. So some properties aren't pet friendly for obvious reasons, allergies and what have you. But we have seen cases where people have smuggled pets into properties and then subsequent damage has occurred. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, well, I think we, we've, we've all experienced that. And uh, and I often get calls from my my owners in their non-pet friendly properties uh, telling us that um, they, they are absolutely positive that there was a pet staying. That, that is something we tend to come down on quite hard as an agency. If somebody does that, then uh, then then we will charge them for additional yeah. additional cleaning. Um, yeah, definitely. It it is an interesting area, and you say, um, what what was the uh, one in five in the one UK? One in five, yeah, and it can be up to seven times cheaper to take your dog on holiday than put it in kennels. Yeah, so it's, absolutely. You no, know, it, it's worth charging a small extra amount to cover extra cleaning or whatever, because it's going to be chances that will be cheaper than it would cost the owner to put the uh, the pet in, in kennels, dog in kennels. In the states, uh, the last statistics I saw was that. Uh, and 63 or so, I think it's either 63 or 65 percent of, uh, of of U.S. citizens actually own a pet. And now the latest figures saying that 30 over 30 percent of the U.S. population will be choosing vacation rentals uh, in the next year uh, as their choice of accommodation. So so that just means more and more people are going to be bringing their pets on vacation. Obviously, the ones that are, are traveling by car. So definitely something to consider, something to ins- talk to your insurance company about and just to see what to, what the coverage is. But f- from in my experience and the experience of 10 years as, as an agency, with, with the majority of our properties that do accept pets, we've had one issue of pet damage in 10 years um, mm. and that that was it it was chewing it was it was a dog that was left in a property during a thunderstorm and and it chewed the carpet around the door obviously trying to get out and all I could think of was a poor you know, about the poor animal that was obviously frightened to death I mean we yeah. have some spectacular thunderstorms here so I can understand that um, the owner had to what what he did was he took up the small piece of carpet and replaced it with tile cost him less than $150 and then the, yeah. and the guest paid up. So I, I know that owners often will shy, shy away from allowing pets into the property, but I, I do find that pet owners tend to be incredibly responsible. There are always those that, uh, that are, are, are not so caring, but they tend on the whole to be very thankful that they've been allowed to bring their pet with them and they're respectful of uh, of that decision of the owner. Um, yeah, and the, and the risks are very, very limited anyway. You know, like you said, it's going to be a... Worst does happen, it's $1,500 to repair uh, any events, but few and far between. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Another point to, to just mention that vermin won't be covered, very rarely covered, or infestations such as... Uh, uh, rats, mice, squirrels. I know that you've had a few issues yourself with uh, friendly bears uh, around your, and skunks around your rentals. Oh, oh yes, yes. Well, uh, you know, wildlife here is is something that we always have to have to consider. Um, and do you know that that's interesting because we we it's something that I <coughs> ought to check with with our insurers about uh, about the whole skunk issue because we we had a skunk living under our deck for quite a while and uh, and if if that got into the house that would probably be pretty disastrous but yes well, I mean we we have mice mouse inf- infestations here mice love cottages but you're saying that they that that type of risk is would not be covered yeah, it's very rarely covered vermin or infestations Phil, tell me about um, loss of rent. What 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 happens when something happens to a property and the people have to be moved out? They have to be moved into a hotel or something like that. Maybe um, a, a natural disaster occurs, and then yeah. then the the property owner is without all that rental income for 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 the foreseeable future. Is is there cover for that? Yeah, if it's if it's an insured event, then obviously you're being reversed from the insurer. Um, Another thing to mention that if insurance isn't a maintenance contract, so let's say if it's a boiler breakdown or something like that, that's unlikely to, to be covered unless you've got a separate insurance maintenance contract. So things like that, you know, your, your handyman, 
are essential for getting things repaired. And then you come into the situation where you might have to, you know, reimburse guests or, or buy them a meal. But for, for big losses where you can't rent out for the next three months, you know, flooding can take six months for property to dry out here. The, the lost income that you've already booked, uh, you should get reimbursed by the insurer. So then obviously then you can refund uh, your guests. Now, that's an interesting one. We um, and it was one I hadn't thought about. We we had our one of my properties was open for rental for the entire winter, but uh, in uh, in February with the with a very deep deep freeze, the water stopped running, and we had a plumber in, and and he has uh, decided that the water line has sheared. It has frozen. It has sheared. It cannot be fixed until the ground is unfrozen, which won't be till May. So we we didn't actually have anybody booked in there. Would that have been? Uh, would would that possibly have? If if we had had you know guests booked in throughout um, the rest of February, March, and April, would that have been an insurable event? I don't think it would have been because it's, there's no actual physical loss to the property, is there? It's, it's just kind of. You've got frozen pipes. It's a it's an issue we had a few years ago here. So there's some I know. There is a, something called trace heating in the UK. You can put on uh, pipes to yeah. uh, it's like an electrical current to keep to keep water flowing. But you know that that's kind of a grey area where you know insurance doesn't cover every eventuality. But it's it, it's it's about understanding the risks that face your property and uh, like you say, having a solution if it's not covered by, by your insurance. You, and you've got issues if you've got bookings there, haven't you? You need to get uh, things up and running. Yeah, absolutely. I, I wrote a blog post recently about um, doing a brainstorm and then writing a what I call the troubleshooting Bible and actually brainstorming the worst possible things that could happen and then mm. what you would do about them. And, and I'm guessing that some of those would be what ifs to present to your insurer and say, OK, yeah. I've got this list of things that might possibly happen. If they did, would they be insured? Yeah, and it's obviously you know made like I said maintenance issues, boiler breakdowns, or block toilets, all things like this. You know, very often won't be covered by your insurer. So you need to address the issue of what would you do. Obviously, how, which plumber would you use? Have you got a separate toilet to use? Uh, just a good task to do that, isn't it? What what if? In the notes that you sent me before the interview, you, you said were well, you going to talk about how to prevent cottage rental disasters by playing the insurance card. And that's intrigued me. Yeah, you know, the, the insurance, it's, it can be used to, uh, to kind of get you out of sticky situations. Let's say you've, you've got a, a rental, you know, and maybe you've seen it on Facebook or they've, they've suggested it to you that, you know, they think of having a, They've got some friends staying locally and they're going to have a barbecue at your place or maybe a, a post-wedding gathering. You know, we all know these things can kind of escalate and, you know, drink may be involved, which increases wear and tear at your property. You know, you can always say that your insurance only covers you for, for X number of people. Uh, so, so obviously they can't do that. Whether that may not, not necessarily apply to your policy, but it's a, it's a good one to use. We use exactly that, in fact. And, uh, and the we, secret's out. Yes, we, we word it as such, and we say that all our properties are covered by restrictive rental insurance, which is, which is absolutely right. The, the, you know, some policies. Yeah, the, some there, are, policies. there are some restrictions. So yeah. that's in one yeah. sentence. And then in the second sentence, yeah. we say that there, there may be restrictions on occupancy, and this is why you cannot have more than six people at this property at any one time you know, these excuses are all there to minimize risk minimize risk and to prevent damage you know and you know as a, as a duty we've got to insurers you know you need to prevent risks and uh, you know another one to use is people who abuse pools you know whether that's inviting more guests over again uh, drinking in the pool or you know using get the pool at night your insurance may not allow that so you, that's another one can I ask you about age restrictions? Because I un I understand that in the UK now that you cannot discriminate um, a a using the age card. I haven't seen it enforced, but I had seen that one of the tourism bodies saying that they were saying that statistically there was no proof that say a uh, a stag do or a group of eighteen year olds were to stay in your property. There was no proof that they were likely to cause more damage than uh, anybody else. 
Well, that's probably because nobody's ever allowed them to do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd that seen with. that one. But because uh, we, we commonly hear, and I, and, and I know this is an issue in, in the US as well, and in some states, they, they, they cannot discriminate on age grounds. Whereas, whereas we will still do it here because some of our insurance companies will, will say that you, you can only have families renting these properties. Um, families mm. mean parents plus children. So, so we we're able to use that when we play the insurance card. Um, that's the one um, we actually use. One well, something that might work better than discriminating is the uh, twenty thousand dollar security bond. Might put the the eighteen year olds off. Oh, that's a good one. It, it's an interesting one and one that comes up over and over again because nobody wants um, a group of 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 twenty. March breakers coming to stay in their in their property, and I know that some owners have come up with some um, quite creative ways on discouraging them, mm. and and I think that that in some cases that, that that's what to, what has to happen rather than outright saying we don't rent to under twenty fives. Yeah, I think once it's clarified that it's a quiet quiet area, you know, the party won't be allowed loud noise at evenings. I think. It's most guests will realise that maybe it's not the place for them. Yeah, I think that that's that's the way it needs if, it needs to happen. If that's their if that's their intention to party, yeah. So um, we, we're just about coming to the end of our time, Phil. Is there anything else that uh, that you want to add that we haven't mentioned so far? I think that we've kind of covered the insurance. You know, look at look at your risk that face your property. Come get make sure you're covered for letting. Check the small print. Choose an insurer you, you have confidence with. You know, just like how they let. Check reviews. What are other people saying? Uh, shop around, but you know, ultimately, check the T's and C's. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, and I will, as I as ever, follow your blog and uh, and 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 your tweets because you're uh, you're always around and about on social media. That I think that's where people are going these days. So I hope to see you there soon. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. It's uh, not always a. Uh, the most of interesting subjects, but you know when the worst happens, it's it's important that you're covered and uh, and make sure that your 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 rentals there to be up and running. Well, everybody wants seven. everybody wants to enjoy it. Uh, guests want to enjoy it, and owners want to enjoy the fact that they have guests in there and and to do it without worrying about uh, about these things. So so thanks again for for all these tips. It's been a it's been a pleasure. And my pleasure too. Thank you very much. Bye. Well, that was really great. There were so many tips that Phil mentioned that I really hadn't thought of. One of them in particular was the the one about uh, non-forced entry. And I'm going to head back to my insurance policy and see if we do have coverage for non-forced entry because I know that the guests down at my cottages will probably go out on canoes or kayaks or take the pedal boat out for maybe an hour or more and I very much doubt that they're going to be locking a door before they leave, which uh, which leaves a property wide open for anybody to come in and uh, and break in very easily if there's an unlocked door. And if we don't have any unforced entry coverage, then we're not going to be cover- covered for any theft that might take place. It's it it's just not going to happen in 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 the place that my cottage is located. But still worthwhile looking at. The other one was, um, and it got actually it was something that got me thinking about my home insurance. That we do have an alarm system, but there's times when we just don't bother to use it because we're we, we're sort of in such a safe area. So that that got us having the conversation about. Uh, setting the alarm a lot more often, and I think this is what is all that what this is all about. It's about having that conversation about your insurance coverage, uh, checking to see what you are covered for, and if you're in any doubt whatsoever, going to see your broker about it. Now, everything that we've mentioned here, um, I've mentioned Philip's website, uh, his uh, Twitter account and um, blog. So I'm putting the the links to those on the uh, on the show notes and you'll find them at um, cottageblogger.com forward slash VRS017. Well, I'd love you to um, comment on the uh, on the show notes with any questions you have. 
and I can direct them back to Phil and hopefully he'll he'll pop in onto the onto the post and answer any insurance questions that uh, you may have about your vacation rentals. Um, of course, if you are able to pop into iTunes, click the button at the bottom of the show notes and leave us a review, I would absolutely love that. And if you've got any comments to make about my intro or outro, then uh, please go ahead. So that's it. That's it for another week. I'm going to roll on into Tim's wonderful outro and I'll be seeing you next time. This episode of Vacation Rental Success is over, but don't worry, Heather will be back soon. Want more great resources? Visit cottageblogger.com for tips, tricks, downloads, and strategies to help you achieve profit from your vacation rental business.